Welcome to Plato's Pod, where we engage in a group discussion on selections from the complete works of Plato, the philosopher and geometer who wrote nearly 2,400 years ago. Today is June 9, 2024, and I'm your host, James Myers. It's an honor to welcome in discussion members of the Toronto, Calgary, and Chicago philosophy meetup groups. Whether you've been with us before or here for the first time, whether you have experience with or are new to Plato's works, I encourage you to add your voice to our dialogue. So as always, to contribute your thoughts to our discussion today, please use the raise hands feature in Zoom. And for everyone's benefit, please relate your comments and opinions to Plato's text. So that everyone has a chance to speak, I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised, using first name only. Once we finish recording in two hours, I invite anyone who wishes to remain online for Plato's Cafe, a casual half-hour discussion on Plato or philosophy in general. This is the 10th meeting of our series on Plato's last and longest dialogue, The Laws, and today we'll be reading Book 7, which begins with the three characters, the unnamed Athenian, Clinias from Crete, and Megillus from Sparta, discussing the raising of children in Crete's new colony to be called Magnesia. It is to be, as we have already heard, a very different type of society than many that have existed up to this day, one whose constitution aims at instilling virtue in the citizens, whereas most, like those of Crete and Sparta, focus on defending against external enemies. In Book 7 today, we'll hear the Athenian state that change is a dangerous thing. But he's not referring to all change, and in particular he states that change leading from evil to the good is praiseworthy. We might understand his meaning if we consider, in addition to the innovation he proposes for the colony's constitution, the equality he says should exist between females and males, which is certainly a change from many constitutions both then and now. So in this respect, there's a striking passage from 804E to 805D on the cover page of today's notes that I have here on the screen. And I'll just pause to read this now because, I, as I say, I found it quite striking. So this begins at 804E. And this is the Athenian talking. Let me stress that this law of mine will apply just as much to girls as to boys. The girls will be trained in precisely the same way. And I'd like to make this proposal without any reservations, whatever, about horse riding or athletics being suitable activities for males, but not for females. You see, although I was already convinced by some ancient stories I've heard, I now know for sure that there are pretty well countless numbers of women, generally called Sarmatians, around the Black Sea, who not only ride horses, but use the bow and other weapons. There, men and women have an equal duty to cultivate these skills, so cultivate them equally they do. And while we're on the subject, here's another thought for you. I maintain that if these results can be achieved, the state of affairs in our corner of Greece where men and women do not have a common purpose and do not throw all their energies into the same activities, is absolutely stupid. Almost every state under present conditions is only half a state and develops only half its potentialities, whereas with the same cost and effort, it could double its achievement. Yet what a staggering blunder for a legislator to make. Clinius replies, but a lot of these proposals, sir, are incompatible with the average state's social structure. However, you were quite right when you said we should give the argument its head and only make up our minds when it had run its course. And here I skip uh, a few lines. And I go on with the Athenian just to end this. The Athenian says, The point I'd like to make, Clinius, is the same one as I made a moment ago, that there might have been something to be said against our proposal if it had not been proven by the facts to be workable. But as things are, an opponent of this law must try other tactics. We are not going to withdraw our, our recommendation that so far as possible, in education and everything else, the female sex should be on the same footing as the male. So here we have, in the new colony of Magnesia, the imagining of a different relationship between people and between people and the laws than we might customarily be familiar with. So custom and habit will feature in the first theme for today's discussion, in selections highlighted in the notes posted to the shared drive link to the event notice on meetup.com. Our second theme will look at the method for instructing children to be in harmony with the community. Our third theme explores a passage from 819b to 820e, in which the Athenian stresses the importance of knowing the relationships between numbers and shapes as the key to understanding both our limitations in the universe and how to find our way to correcting problems that inevitably rise over time when constitutional arrangements become stressed or contentious. So I'll start today's session on teaching and legislating for harmony with two readings, the first discussing the means to dispel fear in children, and the second addressing the interweaving of laws, habits, and institutions in a constitution. So I'll do the first reading here, and then the second. The first one begins at 790a, and it goes to 791c. The Athenian starts, 
But no, that would lead to far too much of what I had just mentioned now. And this is after he had enumerated four possible laws for regulating mothers and nurses. And the Athenian had referred to the problem of such an exacting level of control arising. So he says, that would lead to far too much of what I mentioned just now. Cleanius says, you mean? The Athenian says, the tremendous ridicule we'd provoke. And the nurses, women and slaves with characters to match, would refuse to obey us anyway. Cleanius says, then why do we insist that the rules should be specified? The Athenian says, for this reason, a state's free men and masters have quite different characters to the nurses. And there's a chance that if they hear these regulations, they may be led to the correct conclusion. The state's general code of laws will never rest on a firm foundation as long as private life is badly regulated, and it's silly to expect otherwise. Realizing the truth of this, they made themselves spontaneously adopt their suggestions as rules, and thereby achieve the happiness that results from running their households and their state on proper lines. Clinia says, yes, that's all very reasonable. The Athenian continues, still, let's not abandon this style of legislation yet. We started to talk about young children's bodies, Let's use the same sort of approach to explain how to shape their personalities. Good idea, agrees Clinius. So let's take this as our basic principle in both cases. All young children, and especially very tiny infants, benefit both physically and mentally from being nursed and kept in motion as far as practical throughout the day and night. Indeed, if it could only be managed, they ought to live as though they were permanently on board ship. But as that's not possible, we must aim to provide our newborn infants with the closest possible approximation to this ideal. Here's some further evidence from which the same conclusions should be drawn. The fact that young children's nurses and the women who cure corybantic conditions have learned this treatment from experience and have come to recognize its value. And I suppose you know what a mother does when she wants to get a wakeful child to sleep. Far from keeping him still, she takes care to move him about, rocking him constantly in her arms, not silently, but humming a kind of tune. The cure consists of movement to the rhythms of dance and song. The mother makes her child pipe down, just as surely as the music of the pipes bewitches the frenzied Bacchic reveler. Clinius says, well then, sir, have we any particular explanation for all this? The reason's not very hard to find, responds the Athenian. What is it? asks Clinius. Both these conditions are a species of fear, and fear is the result of some inadequacy in the personality. When one treats such conditions by vigorous movement, this external motion, by cancelling out the internal agitation that gives rise to fear and frenzy, induces a feeling of calm and peace in the soul, in spite of the painful thumping of the heart experienced by each patient. The result is very gratifying. Whereas the wakeful children are sent to sleep, the revelers, far from asleep by being set to dance to the music of the pipes, are restored to mental health after their derangement with the assistance of the gods to whom they sacrifice so propitiously. This explanation, brief as it is, is convincing enough. Yes, indeed, agrees Clinius. Well then, seeing how effective these measures are, here's another point to notice about the patient. Any man who has experienced terrors from his earliest years will be that much more likely to grow up timid. But no one will deny that this is to train him to be a coward, not a hero. Of course, agrees Clinius. Contrarywise, the Athenian continues, we'd agree that a training in courage right from infancy demands that we overcome the terrors and fears that assails us? Exactly, says Clinius. The Athenian concludes, so we can say that exercising very young children by keeping them in motion contributes a great deal towards the perfection of one aspect of the soul's virtue. So I'd start with that, and then I'm going to go on and read another selection as well. I just wanted to highlight there that idea of harmonizing the internal and the external in this part in particular where I've underlined um, induces a feeling of calm and peace in the soul in spite of the painful thumping of the heart. So this soul being the immaterial internal part and the heart being the material part of the body. And it's this idea of kind of harmonizing the material with the immaterial. And, you know, we'll talk about some sections in today's readings, which I think really talk about the patterns designed in nature. Because in book 10, where we started this dialogue, the Athenian talked about the patterns in nature and how we as humans are part of that natural pattern of the universe. So I'll go on to read the second selection that we have here. And this is from 792b to 793d. The Athenian starts, Well then, suppose you do your level best during these years to shelter him from distress and fright and any kind of pain at all. Shouldn't we expect that child to be educated into a more cheerful and genial disposition? Clinius responds, Certainly, and especially, sir, if one surrounded him with lots of pleasures. 
Athenian says, now here, my dear sir, is just where Clinius no longer carries me with him. That's the best way to ruin a child, because the corruption invariably sets in at the very earliest stages of his education. But perhaps I'm wrong about this. Let's see. Clinius says, tell us what you mean. The Athenian continues, I mean that we're now discussing a topic of great importance. So you too, Megillus, see what your views are and help us to make up our minds. My position is this. The right way of life is neither a single-minded pursuit of pleasure nor an absolute avoidance of pain, but a genial, I use the word just now, contentment with the state between those extremes. Precisely the state, in fact, which we always say is that of God himself, a conjecture that's reasonable enough to support it as it is by the statements of the oracles. Similarly, if one of us aspires to live like a god, this is the state he must try to attain. He must refuse to go looking for pleasure on his own account, aware that this is not a way of avoiding pain. Nor must he allow anyone else to behave like that, young or old, male or female, least of all newly born children, if he can help it, because that's the age when habits, the seeds of the entire character, are most effectively implanted. I'd even say that, at the risk of appearing flippant, that all expectant mothers during the year of their pregnancy should be supervised more closely than other women to ensure that they don't experience frequent and excessive pleasures or pains either. An expectant mother should think it important to keep calm and cheerful and sweet-tempered throughout her pregnancy. Aeneas says, There is no need to ask Megillus which of us two has made the better case, sir. I agree with you that everyone should avoid a life of extreme pleasure and pain and always take the middle course between them. Your point has been well and truly put, and you've heard it well and truly endorsed. Admirable Clinius, responds the Athenian. Well then, here's a related point that the three of us should consider. What's that, says Clinius? That all the rules we are now working through are what people generally call unwritten customs, and all this sort of thing is precisely what they mean when they speak of ancestral law. Not only that, but the conclusion to which we were driven a moment ago was the right one, that although laws is the wrong term for these things, we can't afford to say nothing about them, because they are the bonds of the entire social network, linking all written and established laws with those yet to be passed. They act in the same way as ancestral customs dating from time immemorial, which by virtue of being soundly established and instinctively observed, shield and protect existing written law. But if they go wrong and get out of true, well, you know what happens when carpenter's props buckle in a house. They bring the whole building crashing down, one thing on top of another, stays and superstructure, however well built, all because the original timberwork has given away. You see, Clinius, this is what we have to bear in mind in thoroughly binding your state together, while it is still a new foundation. We must do our best not to omit anything, great or small, whether laws, habits, or institutions, because they are all needed to bind a state together, and the permanence of the one kind of norm depends on that of the other. So we ought not to be surprised to see a flood of apparently unimportant customs or usages making our legal code a bit on the long side. I used a different voice in that last line because they definitely do have a, a long legal code as we see throughout this dialogue. So so those I, I thought I would start with those two readings. The first one about harmonizing the soul with the motion of the universe and the second one about the habits and customs sort of being you know, intrinsic or inherent to life and, and needing to incorporate or understand those and to understand how those play with the laws and the institutions of a colony. So we'll go to Michael. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to kind of start off by sort of uh, reflecting on the tenor of these passages. Sometimes I think we can react to these with a, a sense of why the intense scrutiny on the uh, education and physical practice of children. And, and we see in these passages, he even gets down to um, pregnancy itself, like how we conduct, how, how women conduct themselves in pregnancy to achieve certain outcomes for the children. And it can feel stifling or even micromanaging in a way. But as I was reflecting on these readings for today, I sort of stopped to realize when I think about our modern day approaches to children and education, um, especially with idioms like helicopter parenting, <laughs> um, I realized that whether we admit it or not, 
all societies are doing this in some form, meaning we all recognize that the most impressionable period of a person's life are these young formative years and that it's really crucial to bring those children into line with the social values at that time. And so what I think the Athenian is doing here is saying, he, he's sort of just accepting that that's the reality and saying, okay, if we're going to impress values upon impressionable children, let's do it in accordance with reason aiming at the supreme good. Let's not have some story about everyone being free to do it they, as they please. Let's have regulation for how we're going to do the customs and practices of private life. But let's be clear that what we're doing is aiming at virtue. And the other thing I would add to this that I think is really interesting is there's some wisdom about rocking children to sleep that's true in this passage and still true today. And I think it's pretty funny. They envision putting these young babies on, on a ship in their earliest years. That would be the ideal. Now, whether or not that's true, still, I think what's really important to note here is that what Plato is doing is he is having his characters take as given the best available developmental psychology of their time. So uh, the reason I, I emphasize that is there's sometimes an assumption about Plato that he writes dialogues where his characters are not interested in empirical information, but that's only because he doesn't speak in the kind of scientific idiom that we use today. This is their version of what we would call empirical information, where he's saying, here's the best received wisdom for raising children in accordance with good values. Let's put that into practice. So even if we as modern readers today, maybe we look at our developmental psychology and we think, oh, we've learned a thing or two since Plato's time. That's fine. It's still consistent, I think, with the spirit of this passage to bring that information into play, but no longer to reinforce just any given social values, but to help set children on the best possible path to achieve virtue. And that's what I, I really think is the kind of big picture thrust of the two passages that you read. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you. And the next passage that I read will talk about setting the foundation, almost as if you're building a ship, setting the keel for that ship. And so, yeah, we'll we'll see that idea continuing. The interesting idea um, in this section, the, the first part that I read, was when the Athenians said both these conditions are a species of fear, and fear is a result of some inadequacy in the soul or in the personality. And I'm wondering if there is actually some truth in that. This disturbance is some evidence of some sort of fear, internal internalized fear. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. I hadn't really ever thought about it that way. So thank you. And Darren, your thoughts? Would it be possible for me to say something? I'm so sorry. Would it be possible for me to say something? Oh, um, okay. Yeah, sure. Come on in, George. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm trying to drive. I'm trying to handle my phone. I'm really sorry. In any event, what I wanted to say was, what I find very compelling and interesting about this passage that we just read, that you just read, is the idea that you're trying to elevate society. You're trying to elevate humanity. And so... The goal is to get people, elevate them towards authenticity, this idea that, you know, what's the proper way to live, what's the proper attitudes. And so I find this very compelling, actually, very interesting, the idea that we are to work together to elevate the whole of humanity. And, you know, of course, it's very, con very different than our liberal society, in which, you know, everyone's sort of left to their own devices. And if you end up in the gutter, you end up in the gutter. So, I mean, that, that's the point that I would make, this, this communitarian attitude of working together to make us all better. And again, to make the city state, you know, better able to defend itself and operate economically, et cetera, and so forth. Thank you. And yeah, I like that word communitarian. I think that's definitely throughout this dialogue, the, uh, the idea that it's not just every person for themselves, but it's the entire community and the community lives and dies by its ability to foster that cooperation. So I think they're trying to set clearly a very firm, solid foundation for this and acknowledge, as he said in that one section, that it's not just a question of the laws, but it's a question of harmonizing the laws with the 
customs and with the institutions, because all of these, these three make that kind of social fabric, I guess, is maybe a way of putting it. So thanks. And we'll go to Darren. So actually, that was a nice sort of segue into my own thought about harmonizing the laws with the customs and whatnot. So there's something really interesting here regarding the philosophy of law that I wanted to discuss. So insofar as these laws have to conform with the culture and at various points, he talks about like what people will accept and not like the women will not, are not going to accept these, these as laws. So maybe we'll just put them as guidelines. Um, you know, at various points, there's this kind of thing that I, I don't think here or maybe in other places, but at least in what we're reading, I don't know if there's actual, at least in book seven, like a kind of elevating humanity in general that George was talking about. I see this as like forming a good community. And I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, there's not, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, that that's enough for here at least. So this ties into like the issue I wanted to discuss, which is uh, I think related, there's a really interesting philosophy of law here that I wasn't, um, I didn't expect to see in Plato or expect to find in Plato. It sounds very much like actually like conservative thinkers like Edmund Burke and uh, Michael Oakeshott. So here in the second passage you shared with us, like he talks about how the law isn't all like it's based on what he says, the original timber work, which is he says these unwritten customs and norms that we live by. And he calls them the bonds of the entire social framework. And he says here, they link all written and established laws with those yet to be passed. This stuff, like that's foundational for the laws and that's not written down explicitly. And to me, what it sounds like is, and he says like, these are things that are, you know, soundly established and instinctively observed and the shield and protect existing written law. This is stuff you just read earlier. Mm. So it, it sounds like you know, th this idea that manners maybe and these habits and customs are not law are more important and actually are the foundation of law and shield and protect law. I think that's a really interesting idea that I don't know if I've seen it. You know, I even have mm -hmm. read almost all Plato by now. I don't know if I've seen this elsewhere before. So I, I think it's interesting that it's quite explicit here. Um yeah, he says here, we must do our best not to omit anything, great or small, whether laws, habits, or institutions, because they're all needed to bind the state together. Mm -hmm. And the permanence of the one kind of norm depends on that of the other. Okay. Yeah, I think it's true, personally, <laughs> that all this, like the philosophy of law here, even though the book is called the laws, it's actually saying like, laws isn't all that. We need the culture and the personalities and the norms and values of the people to support at least this specific code of laws that we're writing for Magnesia. I also wanted to comment on like the previous stuff you were talking about, about the motions and the babies. I'll say that for later. I've, I've gone on for a while. But I, I just, just one more thing, though, which is that although I like what is said here, I think it's true about the laws. Like laws just won't work if you just like <laughs> if it's just about the written laws. Like you do have it does have to be accommodating with the culture and vice versa. Um, you have to educate the culture towards the laws, even though that can't be completely written or spelled out. I do find the fact that the Athenian mentions this at this moment to be a little confusing, because if you look at the text, it's sort of sandwiched between <laughs> various other um, proposals that aren't actually entirely about the norms and culture, because he talks about how in, uh, for instance, during the pregnancy, so you'll think, okay, this is just all advice about pregnancy. But he says that expectant mothers should be supervised more closely than other women to ensure that they, you know, don't do all the bad stuff. And then right after that, he talks more about the people who actually do the supervision and their nurses who are themselves to be very strictly supervised by other women who are elected for the purpose. So I like this stuff about all the cultural foundations of law and so on. But like, I just find where it came up to be a little confusing because you'll see that although he mentions he's just, he's just discussing guidelines and stuff but then like we do have a lot of people we do have a whole institutions of people supervising and policing all this stuff so i don't know like how culture it is if you have all these police marching around you know um monitoring all the all the women and all the mothers so that's just my little qualm with it yeah no thank you he did say with that that he was raising that 
but at the risk of seeming flippant, because this passage, actually the first one that I read, started after he had enumerated four possible laws for regulating mothers and nurses. He admitted to the problem of that. He said this would lead to tremendous ridicule and they wouldn't obey him anyway. So I think it's really a sign that he's recognizing that there's a level of practicality about lawmaking that needs to factor in and that you can't just make whatever ideal laws you think that there are, but you have to make practical laws, laws that people will understand and obey. And I think that's really the power of bringing in the, the idea of habits and customs, because if you understand those, it really is, I think, as he said, really one of those carpenter's props underneath the, the house that keeps the house standing. And then we'll see actually in the next section that I'll read perhaps a bit more contentious view of customs and, and habits, but we can talk about that. But he's not saying that all customs and habits should be maintained, but good ones. So we'll see that in the next part. Fred? I think de Tocqueville really typifies that. That, that seems to be the, the primary thesis of de Tocqueville's democracy in America, is that the foundation of civilization is its civil institutions, uh, extra legal civil institutions, town halls, churches, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, all those volunteer activities that embody the norms of the culture, but are not enforced by laws. And so I think uh, Plato here is grappling with how far the legal system should I would say interfere, or at, at the very least influence those civil institutions, or hopefully encourage the civil institutions. But de Tocqueville seems to me to be the, the clearest exposition of that notion that there are limits to what we can do with a legal structure, and that the foundation of civilization cannot be found in uh, legal structures, but rather in uh, civil structures. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Fred, for that really helpful comparison. I think that was great. And what you said, too, it was really interesting about the Athenian struggling to balance, I guess, the laws with the civil structures. Um, I guess part of that is to, as they instill a sense of virtue in the citizens, then these things will be more in harmony than they are if perhaps the social institutions are you know, more based on the very individualistic view. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. So thank you. We'll go to George. And then after George, I'll do the second reading, but it really continues along this same path. So it's not really breaking the discussion at all. So George, your thoughts. I think there might be a bit, and you had it now, when you, when you talk right now, I think you're really on mark, which is that, what Plato's arguing here is acknowledging, look, you just can't pass laws and expect people simply to obey them, right? The laws are there to elevate society. So the laws are the basis to teach customs, to adjust norms. We need to bring people into rationality. Now, the other key point that I want to stress here, and what's really interesting, is that he's positing a conception of public health and a notion of public health that is based in rationality. So you must keep in mind, that for most people, you know, basically what medical treatment represented was going and praying and, and, you know, doing different things and, you know, in other words, doing sacrifices, that was public health. So here he's arguing, no, you know, we need to institute the best public health practices. And that's the rational society, right? So you observe what works as a method and then you seek to apply that. So again, he's arguing Yes, we need to make society rational. We recognize that people aren't rational. You just can't will it. You have to deal with norms and customs and change in those norms and customs. So, for example, women can be accepted fully as full and equal citizens because he says at the beginning that's irrational and that just doesn't make any sense. So we just have to work through customs. Again, the laws are there to elevate society, not simply to enforce laws, but to elevate society and bring this closer to the ideal rationality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well said. And actually, it just makes me think of this section that I have here on the screen from the first reading that I did, where he said that the state's general code of laws will never rest on a firm foundation as long as private life is badly regulated, and it's silly to expect otherwise. 
Realizing the truth of this, they may themselves spontaneously adopt our suggestions as rules and thereby achieve the happiness that results from running their households and their state on proper lines. So he's not saying they're going to regulate private life. He's saying that, you know, maybe realizing, as you said, the rationale of that. And then Clinius follows up with a statement that's all very reasonable. And that makes me think of the role of reason in Book 10, where we started our discussion on the laws where uh, the Athenian situates reason right in the very center of the universe and reason came into existence before the physical universe came into existence. So here, maybe they're really talking about uh, the application of reason where they can't regulate something right down to the level of private lives that just wouldn't work. They have to rely on reason. So thank you. Um, let me go to the second part of this reading. I'll do another two sections here. This one is from 797b to 798b, and the Athenian starts, I maintain that no one in any state has really grasped that children's games affect legislation so crucially as to determine whether the laws that are passed will survive or not. If you control the way children play, and the same children always play the same games under the same rules, and in the same conditions, and get pleasure from the same toys, you'll find that the conventions of adult life too are left in peace without alteration. But in fact, games are always being changed and constantly modified and new ones invented. And the younger generation never enthuses over the same thing for two days running. They have no permanent agreed standard of what is becoming or unbecoming, either in deportment or in their possessions in general. They worship anyone who is always introducing some novelty or doing something unconventional to shapes and colors and all that sort of thing. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that this fellow is the biggest menace that can ever afflict a state because he quietly changes the character of the young by making them despise old things and value novelty. That kind of language and that kind of outlook is, I, again, I say, the biggest disaster any state can suffer. Listen, I'll tell you just how big and evil I maintain it is. Clinia says, you mean the way the public grumbles at old-fashioned ways of doing things? Exactly, says the Athenian. Clinius continues, well, you won't find us shutting our ears to that kind of argument. You won't have a more sympathetic audience. This is coming from Clinius from Crete and Magellus from Sparta will agree just because of the nature of their constitutions. And the Athenian says, well, so I should imagine. Clinius says, go on then. The Athenian says, well, now let's listen to the argument with even greater attention than usual and expound it to each other with equal care. Change we shall find except in something evil is extremely dangerous. This is true of the seasons and winds, the regimen of the body and the character of the soul, in short of everything without exception, unless, as I said just now, the change affects something evil. Take as an example the way the body gets used to all sorts of food and drink and exercise. At first they upset it, but then in the course of time, it's this very regimen that is responsible for its putting on flesh. Then the regimen and the flesh form a kind of partnership so that the body grows used to this congenial and familiar system and lives a life of perfect happiness and health. But imagine someone forced to change again to one of the other recommended systems. Initially, he's troubled by illnesses, and only slowly, by getting used to his new way of life, does he get back to normal. Well, we must suppose that precisely the same thing happens to a man's outlook and personality. When the laws under which people are brought up have by some heaven-sent good fortune remained unchanged over a very long period, so that no one remembers or has heard of things ever being any different, the soul is filled with such respect for tradition that it sinks from meddling with it in any way. Somehow or other, the legislator must find a method of bringing about this situation in the state. So I think we might find some things maybe a little bit contentious in that. Um, I'll stop there. I'll stop there and we can maybe just chat about that. So he's talking there about innovation and especially its effect on children. And I put a footnote on this sentence here. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that this fellow is the biggest menace that can ever afflict a state because he quietly changes the character of the young by making them despise old things and value novelty. I think maybe one of the key things there we might want to think about is the word he. This is change being wrought by one individual as opposed to maybe the parents or as opposed to the community as a whole. So is one individual equipped to appreciate the consequences of the novelty that the individual is introducing when the novelty is being introduced at a very young age, at a formative age, which will begin habits that will continue perhaps for a lifetime. So just wondering what we think about this section in terms of, you know, just continuing that discussion about habits and customs and how they tie in with the laws and communal harmony. Michael. I think that we could probably make some modern analogs to that sentence you have on the screen 
to make this fresh and alive. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by despise old things? I remember talking to, you know, one of my physicist friends at Stanford who said, you know, we don't read anybody who wrote longer ago than 25 years. And so he said, I've never read Einstein. I've never read Niels Bohr. I've never read uh, even Richard Feynman, who's not particularly that old. And um, I think there is a tendency to think the latest thing is the best thing. And here the Athenian seems to want to set forth space for timeless wisdom, which will inevitably become an old thing to not be a devalued thing. And I think same for the phrase novelty. That might not strike the right chord, I think, with a modern audience. I, I think the way we would put it today is making them despise old things and value the latest fad. That's what I think Plato's really getting at here is, is uh, you know, people who are sort of riding the next wave of whatever's trendy and in and exciting and therefore destabilizing because you're barely into the latest fad before the next fad comes and you're on to that thing and, and the next and the next and the next and you're never building something that is consistent and lasting. And to step back from this and just make one last general comment, I think this whole discussion about change is one of the perennial themes in Plato that's really interesting because Plato is trying to balance both an understanding that change is a necessary and inevitable part of the physical realm and his belief that there are transcendent truths which will persist across changes. And so what he's really getting at here is not, he's very clear, change is not all bad. In fact, there's at least one good kind of change, and that is course correction when we're doing something bad. Um, no, I, I think what he's really getting at here is the heart of a good society is a society that finds those timeless truths and builds on them and remains faithful to them over long periods of time. And that, I think, is a very radical idea from a modern perspective and um, a more a more tractable way to read this section. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess that could be contentious for those who don't believe that there are timeless truths. You know, that would be Plato's realm of being, you know, the realm of the forms that's accessible not to the five physical senses, but to the faculty of reason. And we live in this realm of becoming, which is constantly changing, but that realm of being is timeless and changeless and infinite. So I guess this would be a problematic for those to understand the idea of reconciling those two different realms that we inhabit, both of those two realms. I mean, it, our minds inhabit the realm of being, but the body inhabits the realm of becoming, and we have to harmonize with that. So I think that's a, an interesting problem. And you know, as I said at the beginning, Clearly, he is proposing that there are some good changes, like the equality of women and men. I mean, that was that was a very striking passage that I read right at the beginning of this meeting, which I think is something that maybe was not in practice at the time uh, and still is not in practice. But that was, I, I think, very interesting, and that demonstrates the idea that there can be good changes. And I just wanted to comment on what you said about the physicists. I mean, it's really interesting, actually, that some don't want to go back and read some of the foundational works because I think maybe in looking at the logic of some of those foundational works, they might find some different paths than others have gone on since. A lot of current stuff has been built on paths that people have selected to take certain ideas in a certain way. But sometimes, and I find this too, if I go back to actually something that's foundational, like, you know, for example, a physicist might read the actual work of Einstein and find in that some process, some mental process going on in Einstein, that if the reader were to replicate that process or to follow that process, it might lead to a very interesting new idea. So I found that was very interesting. Thank you for that. We'll go to Darren and then Fred. Darren. James, I feel like you're recommending what the Athenian himself is going to recommend at this end of this book to read his quote-unquote collected works. But 
I could not possibly imagine what that would mean, but <laughs> yeah. so actually, so Michael and yourself already captured a lot of what I wanted to say. I think as you've mentioned already, James, like this third section we're looking at now is closely related to, you know, the, the, the stuff we were discussing before, because previously he was concerned with how the laws can be preserved. And it's not just through law that they can ever be preserved. You know, he's very clear that it's through custom habits. Um, I understand it's like culture. I don't think they had, maybe didn't have that concept at the time yet that, as he said, they shield and protect existing written law. And there's a lot actually in that previous passage that's very evocative. Like there's a lot more to think about because he says it's this sort of the original timber work, the metaphor he used, that ties together the laws that were and the laws that will be. So that's really interesting. It's like the thing that is like continuous. And anyway, there, there's actually still a lot more there to think about. But um, regarding... um. Um, yeah, this, okay. I was going to focus more on change. Right. And so, yeah, so I think we saw in the previous passage too, this concern with, I mean, another way to understand it is stability is how a society could be stable. And this was, you know, compared to the Republic, which is not like the really, really ideal Republic, which is not stable. Actually, that would be a problem for any political view. If you come up with some sort of ideal that like you try to instantiate it and it doesn't last, I mean, that's kind of a problem and it's probably means it's not true. So it really brings that problem to the fore, which I think is interesting. And the way it's solved is not through more law, but through understanding human psychology and this empirical aspect, but also through like a lot of really picky guidelines, as we'll see further on. Maybe this is some of the controversial stuff James was alluding to, too, like because we're going to have really strict forms of music that can never be changed. And we have strict forms of dancing and rules about how to dance, which can also never be changed and so on and so forth. So, you know, I don't know how in our society today we would have like just one like he literally just defined very strictly like what the music, the form of the music has to be like. I don't think... We would have to have different forms for our, our way of life. Let's just put it that way. And um, yeah, okay. So when that, just a final quick comment, which is that I think a lot rests on precisely what Michael and yourself also were talking about. Like what exactly is meant to be stable here and what exactly is meant to be changed? Because I could see how he seems to come out against change, which is I think why James was saying it's controversial. Some of these comments seem quite sweeping, but I think, you know, Michael was right that a lot does depend on on what exactly is being indicated to change and not change. Like everything rests on that question. I'll just put it th that way. Like, because the idea of being against change at first, when I first read it, it, it really struck me as against the world we live in these days. It's not just like, you know, a liberal society like Canada or whatever, <laughs> that's like continuously changing. It's everywhere. It's India. It's China. It's Vietnam, which is going extremely rapid economic development right now. It's also like Taiwan and Japan and Korea. It's not just like a Western liberal thing. We live in a world of modernity, which has this continuous change. But I don't know if this is like necessarily contradicts Plato per se, because it just depends on what part are we changing. Although Canada has gone, I mean, our Canadian constitution has gone through a few changes, but like it's more or less stayed some of the spirit has stayed the same for a long time, despite all the changes we've been through, including recently the technological internet revolution, right? So um, maybe a lot, again, a lot depends on like exactly what we're talking about, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Yeah. Well, thanks. And I find that part about, you know, prescribing the type of music, I have some difficulty with that. I mean, I think I can understand it in the context of children, especially, but, you know, for those of us who, you know, enjoy a variety of music. Um, I'm not so sure I would like to live in a society that prescribes the type of music, but you know, maybe there's a reason for that. But I would just say that he does in the last reading that I'll do today, as I mentioned in the introduction, he does introduce kind of a method or at least a an approach to change because he acknowledges that there will be stresses over time to the constitution. And maybe as the community changes and ideas change and habits change, that causes some stress on the constitution. We see this across the world now. I mean, there's, you know, ancient constitutions that are under severe stress. I live in Canada, which is a relatively new country. Our constitution has been only around for 150 years or so, but, but some older countries are undergoing stress. But he actually does talk in the last part that I'll read about how it's possible to amend constitutions. And he talks about how to do it. So yeah, 
Just yeah. quickly though, although only like a hundred years or so, and you know, only a few decades since our last big reforms, but we've gone through a lot of changes through those times, like wars, yeah. huge technological yeah. changes. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. And Fred. And th this last paragraph here, he says uh, that the Athenian says the younger generation never enthuses over the same thing for two days running. They worship anyone who is always introducing some novelty or doing something unconventional. Okay, that's a remark that's a, sort of a plus de change remark, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's an eternal truth, because it's very evident these days. And there's a, there's a whole cottage industry developed around that. It's called a, a cool hunt, uh, where you hunt for the next, the next big thing. The assumption is that whatever is extremely popular now is automatically obsolete. So you have to look for the next big thing. And so there are uh, very well-paid marketing professionals whose job is basically to conduct a cool hunt, to find out what that critical demographic of 14 to 18 will next take unto themselves. And their, their motivation, of course, of course, is purely profit, although Typically, the next big thing is a rebellion, theoretically, against a material profit culture. They cynically know, we cynically know, that in fact, those artists, artists in quotes, who most complain uh, or who most demonstrate in their music and otherwise against the current culture, are in fact extremely profitable in those endeavors. So I, I think it's interesting that this is just uh, absolutely timeless and as Darren has pointed out, a really universal attribute, this constant search for the new thing. And uh, it seems that the suggestion here is that in education, they should counteract that. They should give them a grounding in classic. And the, the goal here, the, the, the focus is the art music and uh, speech, not technology. So new technology is great and wonderful, but if you're constantly looking for the new thing in uh, speech and in music, at best you'll be current for a few years and then you'll be totally obsolete and whatever knowledge you might've gained in that context is completely worthless. And so why not ground yourself in the classics in for example, being able to put together an English sentence that's understood, which is a sorely needed skill, which is largely neglected. I'm always surprised at the number of postgraduate degree computer science and science people who, who are just embarrassingly uh, deficient in being able to put together an English sentence, but apparently that's the norm. So there, there's a lot to be said for that. Mm. Thanks. No, thank you. And I, I agree fully with you on your observation about language. I It bothers me to no end that people are not being taught how to express themselves clearly and in a way that's understood. And I think, as you said, it's maybe a question of grounding. I mean, before you go innovating, understand the basics, I guess, is maybe part of that. And, uh, you know, I would say, too, that music seems to have a special place in Plato. And, you know, it came out, I think, in that first reading that I did, maybe, when he was talking about babies that were acting under fear and needing to be calmed down. And so the way you calm a, a baby who's bawling is you you rock it uh, and you, you hum to it. And he says the same thing with revelers, which maybe takes us back to the drinking parties that we talked about in the earlier books of the laws. So it seems to have a special place, and maybe that's part of the fabric of nature, which I referred to in my introduction that relates to book 10. So yeah, some interesting comments, but thank you very much for that cool hunt. I hadn't heard that term before, but clearly that is something that is going on now and the technological means are there to spread these memes across the planet very quickly. And it's the young people, I think, who are especially uh, prone to this and uh, as you say, it's done with a profit motive. And certainly we see in the laws that there's many warnings against those who try to innovate 
just for the sake of profit. So, so I appreciate that. So thank you. And we'll go to George. And then after George, I'll do the next reading. George. In pondering this section, don't, I'm reminded of the fact that Socrates was essentially executed because he corrupted the youth. So, I mean, this is seemingly what Plato's referring to. He says, look, you know, it's easy to corrupt the youth, right? So how do you elevate them through the laws, through customs and norms, when, you know, people come along all the time and say, oh, well, you know, they want to elevate women to equality, men, you know, young boys, that's silly, right? So again, leading them astray. And so ultimately, he's simply identifying this as a problem in seeking to keep young people on the straight and narrow towards rationality, towards maturity, towards elevation, when people will always come along like sophists and say, no, 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 give in to your appetites, give in to your worst devices. And so he's just simply saying this is a social problem that, you know, again, that you can be corrupted. And they're easily corrupt and they're easily distracted. It's just something that society has to deal with in terms of trying to elevate humanity. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's That was a fabulous observation, I think, that uh, I hadn't even thought about that. So, you know, the claim was that Socrates had corrupted the youth. So they put Socrates to death for that. And yeah, what do you do if you don't want to corrupt the youth? Well, you prevent uh, unwarranted innovations, I guess. So I guess they were thinking that Socrates' questions were innovations. Well, you know, that was maybe going too far, but uh, maybe there is something in that. So that's great. No, thank you. It's interesting because I think, again, he's identifying a problem. I don't know. He doesn't go as far as to say we need to have laws against corrupting the youth. He's just saying this is something that we have to keep in mind as we try to work through the laws and elevating people that the youth can be corrupted. Not that yeah. we should put people to death, but he's saying that's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it works both ways, as it did with Socrates. So, yeah, Darren, I see your hand up, but I'll read this next section, which is reasonably short, and it kind of continues on the same theme in any event. So we'll uh, we'll continue on with the same thoughts. Um, so let me just read this next part, which is, I call this the second theme for today, the, the method for instruction in harmony. So they start to talk about how the instruction will take place. And this is starts at 803a. The Athenian says, now to deal with how this doctrine should be taught and handed on, what method of instruction should we use? Who should be taught and when should the lessons take place? Well, you know that when a shipwright is starting to build a boat, the first thing he does is to lay down the keel as a foundation and as a general indication of the shape. I have a feeling my own procedure now is exactly analogous. I'm trying to distinguish for you the various ways in which our character shapes the life we live. I really am trying to lay down the keel because I'm giving proper consideration to the way we should try to live, to the character keel we need to lay if we are going to sail through this voyage of life successfully. Not that human affairs are worth taking very seriously, but take them seriously is just what we are forced to do, alas. Still, perhaps it will be realistic to recognize the position we're in and direct our serious efforts to some suitable purpose. My meaning? Yes, you'd be certainly right to take me up on that. Clinias agrees, exactly. The Athenian says, I maintain that serious matters deserve our serious attention, but trivialities do not. That all men of good will should put God at the center of their thoughts. That man, as we said before, has been created as a toy for God, and that this is the great point in his favor. So every man and every woman should play this part and order their whole life accordingly, engaging in the best possible pastimes, in a quite different frame of mind to their present one. How do you mean? asks Clinius. The usual view nowadays, I fancy, is that the purpose of serious activity is leisure, that war, for example, is an important business and needs to be waged efficiently for the sake of peace. But in cold fact, neither the immediate result nor the eventual consequences of warfare ever turn out to be the real leisure or an education that really deserves the name. And education is, in our view, just about the most important activity of all. So each of us should spend the greater part of his life at peace, and that will be the best use of his time. What, then, will be the right way to live? A man should spend his whole life at play, sacrificing, singing, dancing, so that he can win the favor of the gods and protect himself from his enemies and conquer them in battle. He'll achieve both these aims if he sings and dances in a way we've outlined. His path, so to speak, has been marked out for him, and he must go on his way confident that the poet's words are true. And here he quotes three lines from the Odyssey. Some things, Telemachus, your native wit will tell you, and heaven will prompt the rest. The very gods, I'm sure, has smiled upon your birth and helped to bring you up. It's not saying that the gods are directing us, but they kind of set the stage and prompt us. Then he goes on. And those we bring up to must proceed in the same spirit. 
They must expect that although our advice is sound as far as it goes, their guardian deity will make them further suggestions about sacrifices and dancing, telling them the various divinities and whose honor they should hold their various games and on what occasion, so as to win the gods' goodwill and live the life that their own nature demands, puppets that they are mostly and hardly real at all. Magilla says, that, sir, is to give the human race a very low rating indeed. Athenia says, don't be taken back, Magillus. You must make allowances for me. I said that with my thoughts on God and was quite carried away. So if you like, let's take it that our species is not worthless, but something rather important. I'll read that. And then this is another very short part here uh, that kind of continues on this um, idea of being at play. Uh, this is 806E to 807D. The Athenian says, now that our citizens are assured of a moderate supply of necessities and other people have taken over the skilled work, what will be their way of life? Suppose that their farms have been entrusted to slaves who provide them with sufficient produce of the land to keep them in modest comfort. Suppose that they take their meals in separate messes, one for themselves, another nearby for their families, including their daughters and their daughters' mothers. Assume the messes are presided over by officials, male and female as the case may be, who have the duty of dismissing their respective assemblies after the day's review and scrutiny of the diner's habits. And that when the official and his company have poured libations to whatever gods that day and night happen to be dedicated, they all duly go home. Now, do such leisured circumstances leave them no pressing work to do? No generally appropriate occupation? Must each of them get plumper and plumper every day of his life, like a fatted beast? No, we maintain that's not the right and proper thing to do. A man who lives like that won't be able to escape the fate he deserves, and the fate of an idle, fatted beast that takes life easy is usually to be torn to pieces by some other animal, one of the skinny kind who have been emaciated by a life of daring and endurance. Our ideal, of course, is unlikely to be realized fully so long as we persist in our policy of allowing individuals to have their own private establishments, consisting of house, wife, children, and so on, but if we could ever put into practice the second best scheme we're now describing, we'd have every reason to be satisfied. So we must insist that there is something left to do in a life of leisure, and it's only fair that the task imposed, far from being light or trivial one, should be the most demanding of all. As it is, to dedicate your life to winning a victory at Delphi or Olympia keeps you fair to busy to attend to other tasks. But a life devoted to the cultivation of every physical perfection and every moral virtue, the only life worth the name, will keep you at least twice as busy. Inessential business must never stop you from taking proper food and exercise or hinder your mental and moral training. To follow this regimen and to get the maximum benefit from it, the whole day and whole night is scarcely enough time. All right, well, thank you for listening to that. So, you know, just really continuing on, I guess, the same theme. So I have Darren, then Michael, and then George, and then Fred. So we'll start with Darren. Yeah, I put my hand up or something about change stuff we were talking about before. Um, maybe just a quick thought about what you were just reading, though, and then I'll discuss the change mm -hmm. thing. I don't know if this is later on, but he also talks about how um, every gentleman must have a timetable prescribing what he is to do every minute of his life. <laughs> and you can't sleep very much. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of rules, and I'm guessing, like, people supervising everyone in this society... So it seems like I'm, I'm going to raise this as a question for other people. Maybe they can help me out. So you read a lot there, James. So at, at one point, it sounds like he's saying that the point of everything in our way of life should aim at a virtue, basically. Well, both physical and um, moral. We need to have both those perfections. But at, I think, where you start around 803C, that section... He talks about how here, all men of goodwill should put God at the center of their thoughts. That man, as we said before, has been created as a toy for God. And he says, a man should spend his whole life at play, sacrificing, singing, dancing, so that he can win the favor of the gods and protect himself from his enemies and conquer them in battle. He'll achieve both these aims if he sings and dances in the way we've outlined. And he has this weird moment where he says he got his thoughts got carried away with God. So... I, I guess, like, is there a sort of, I guess, is is there just this implicit idea that these are equivalent, that if you have your mind set on God, then, you know, you're realizing both the physical, or you will realize the physical and moral virtues. I, I'm assuming also the right gods, right? Because there's, <laughs> he, he has issue with all the wrong gods that people are. 
I, I just feel like there's two messages here. And so are, are they equivalent or there may be something I mentioned the previous beat up, like there's sort of two tracks in ethics. There's sort of like the more like sophisticated version for like people who can get it. And then there's sort of the more general version for the masses. I don't know. I'm just, I just feel like maybe there are two messages here, but maybe I'm just misreading. Cause like, yeah, there's, there was a lot in that, in, in those passages you read. And then I just want to come back to, yeah. So George brought up the Socrates thing earlier and uh, <laughs> he was um, executed for corrupting the youth. I mean, so that's a kind of change, right? So that it does really bring that question to the fore of like what kind of changes actually is bad because in order to <laughs> institute magnesia or even, you know, to make reforms in their own societies, you know, that, that would be changed too. I want to zoom in though on one to sort of, I guess, I don't know if you call it an epistemic aspect of change, like in, a, in terms of our understanding. So he does talk about in that section how like heaven sent good fortune re that our laws remain unchanged over a very long period so that no one remembers or has heard of things ever being different. <laughs> the soul is filled with such respect for tradition that it shrinks from meddling with it in any way. And so somehow or other, the legislator must find a method to bring about the situation. So yeah, th this sounds like a state of, you know, stability in terms of our understanding and ideas people hard like can't even remember when things have ever been different or hear things having been any different i mean this could be another one of these problematic things at least maybe if you look at this superficially um i'm thinking right now like something that js mill said that you don't really know an idea you don't really know know something unless you've also heard the opposing views and the best versions of the opposing views not just the straw man versions so you can't just hear one side. So if these people have only ever heard of one view and don't remember things ever being any different, that just sounds to me like those, you know, maybe pre-modern society where, you know, a church dominated, like one church dominated and dictated the beliefs for everyone. And, you know, you can't really question things and there's no, there's no room for questioning. But this isn't just a J.S. Mill thing. OK, so I'm not just <laughs> introducing idea external, mm -hmm. this thing in, externally. This is also Socrates' thing. So this is what I thought of it because Socrates came up. So as we know from Socrates, he doesn't he he isn't there to preach ideas. He's there to help people start questioning things. In fact, to question their ideas. In fact, it's hard to know what Socrates actually thought because, as you know, we know we read so many of his dialogues. Now he's really just exploring ideas, questioning things, and getting people to wonder, getting people interested in philosophy, getting people to think and to exercise their reason. But it seems like that method isn't about preaching and, you know, sort of just pouring a new idea into people. It's just to getting to think, to exercise their reason. And so they need that independence of thought. I feel like that's the whole purpose of these mm -hmm. dialogues that end in aporia. So it's actually Plato's very own dialogical approach that actually means that we have to explore these different ideas. So this like ideal heaven sent state he describes here where, you know, everything where ideas are just so locked in stone that no one ever even wonders anything else. It's a little bit weird. It's another weird thing about that, but maybe there's, you know, a way of reconciling it, especially with, you know, Plato's own dialogical approach and with the, and Socrates' approach too. Yeah, thanks. And, and actually that makes me think of that question of questions and where is their allowance made for questions in this community? And that's something that maybe we can think about as we continue to read. There is one thing here too I wanted to point out in that last part that I read, the statement that man is being created as a toy for God and that this is the great point in his favor. And, you know, also that point about him having his mind on God and thinking that man is rather unimportant relative to God. So maybe there is some basis here. You know, maybe it's part of just having that deep basis, kind of universal basis. Once you understand the universal basis of things, you wouldn't want to change it. But um, I guess that's important in how you get there. I mean, it's really important on how you set the foundation, that keel that he talks about, because life is rather a bit of a turbulent ocean sometimes. It made me think this part when he says, man is a toy for God, and that this is a great point in his favor, because in one respect, it makes God seem like a child. But then we started by talking about children uh, in the first reading that I did, and that this is a great point in his favor. Well... I mean, a child loves his toys. And so, you know, maybe this is why it's in our favor that we are toys. Um, so anyway, just wondering what people think about that. So we'll go on to Michael and then George and Fred.
Michael. I do want to speak to the toy comment in just a second, but maybe as a follow-up to Darren's question about the place of change and, you know, asking questions and so forth in society. You know, I think it's important to hold in mind where we started from. Remember in book one, the big problem to solve here was the perpetuation of war. And as part of that, the constant threat of civil war, which is the dissolution of a society. So I think back to 1945, 46, you know, the conversations that the Western allies were having in the wake of World War II, their sentiment at that time was we should build international institutions to make it so that this constant change of these, you know, global conflicts erupting should come to an end and not resurface. Now, I think there's a legitimate question as to whether or not the programs they put in place have succeeded, but I see that aspiration as very similar to the type of aspiration that's running through the Athenians' conversation here, that it's not locking down society for the purpose of, you know, never allowing any kind of alterations or anything like that. It's it's wrestling with the question of how do you build something that lasts? In 1946, the question was, how do you build a global world order that won't turn on itself and lead to endless perpetuation of war? Um, frankly, that's a question I wish we'd come back to here in 2024. And I think in Plato's time, he's wrestling with a similar type of question of how can you build a society that actually gives, say, the second, third, or fourth generation an actual future, meaning you actually think there will be a society in two, three, four generations and not just, you know, become a, a vassal state for the latest empire or whatever, um, or have devolved into some kind of plutocracy where the rich are pillaging everybody else. So that, that I think, is the real question is just, how do you build anything that lasts, that remains? Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is related to the toy comment because um, there's a really interesting dialectical moment happening in the excerpt that James read because we get this vantage point from the view that human beings are not intrinsically valuable because we're toys of the God. And then he switches to a vantage point where human beings are intrinsically valuable. Now, why do we need this back and forth? And I think it's because we need simultaneously to sort of hold both the commonness and the greatness of humanity in our minds. The commonness is the universe does not exist for our sake. It's not all about us. We're not the center of existence. But on the flip side, we are the creatures that have the ability to aspire to divine things. And so to build a good society, you sort of have to have this remarkable anthropology that is simultaneously a low view of humans and a high view of humans. Because if you have one or the other, you're going to end up with either humans as tyrants or the justification for doing whatever you want towards humans because they don't matter at all. And so I think there's a really interesting balance that's being struck there. One last 30 second comment, which is in the discussion of being idle. I just want to note that I, I think this is a remark that's really aimed at the rich because this is the passage 806E to 807D. Because what is he describing here? I want to be clear. Uh, the Athenian is not endorsing the view, the, the lifestyle that's being described here. Um, it's a misreading, I think, to take this as an endorsement. This is the kind of life you want. Um, no, he's describing the life that the senior most plutocrats in Thessaly at the time would have. And in that life, they were incredibly idle, as, <laughs> as the rich often become. And so what he's saying here is even if you had all of the gifts of the wealthiest people that we can imagine in this lifestyle, 
Does that mean, therefore, you have no responsibilities and obligations? Absolutely not. And you still have the highest responsibility of all, which is to be a good person. And that is a maximally demanding responsibility, one that you'll never have time off from. And therefore, the lifestyle of the rich and famous is without merit. Or at least that's how I read the passage. Thank you. Thank you. And you said so many interesting and uh, I think very valuable things there. What you said about the life of leisure, I, I think there was that part that I read earlier where Clinius said, well, the next best thing then would be to give all of the pleasurable things to the children. And the Athenian says, no, absolutely not. I'm not with you on that one. So, and recognizing, I think, too, in this passage about a man who lives like that won't be able to escape the fate he deserves and the fate of an idle, fattened beast like that who takes life easy is usually to be torn to pieces by some other animal of the skinny kind who's being emaciated by a life of daring and endurance. And, you know, this speaks maybe to the world today and to what you were talking about, about even the question of is there going to be a future? There are a lot of these people who have not had any leisure luxuries. And there's a lot more of them than the very wealthy. And I think at some point, a balance needs to be struck before the the have-nots uh, will use their numbers to challenge the haves. So I think that's a, an important point. And, you know, as you said, it's a question of building a lasting society and one that is out of tune with itself, one that is unbalanced, is not going to last. And I think we're seeing the stresses in society now, as you said, you know, after World War II came out of this horrendous situation where 60 million people died because of one tyrant. And, you know, are, have we learned the lesson? Have we have we got our act together globally? No, we're, we're splitting apart into separate tribes again. And, you know, the, the drums of war are beating. So this is not something that we need to leave our children. We need to fix this. It makes me think, too, just one last comment about how change would be affected in this society. So in book six, two weeks ago, we talked at the beginning about the method of election of the guardians of the laws. And I think maybe in that there's enough processes where people have the right to, for example, say that a candidate, they don't think a candidate is fit uh, for office. This putting of the, the tablets into the marketplace, if you don't think that they're fit, and then weaning it down to the final selection that way. So I think everybody does have a say there and that there is maybe some method of redress if the habits and customs and laws are no longer applicable or need to be updated. So yeah, there's a, a bunch of things there, but yeah, thank you very much. A lot of, a lot of good things to touch on. So I'll go to George and then Fred. In terms of the first part that you read, I think what Plato's speculating on really is really speaking almost to the question of free will. In other words, do we simply, is that the purpose politically of society to look at what the gods will and just replicate that and just replicate that? And that's a notion that are we just the toys of the gods? And maybe there is an argument for that. He says, again, you know, basically I think he's saying, you know, we can't take this too far. Maybe I'm being too extreme here in saying that everything is external to man, justice, rationality. There is some kind of guidebook that we can deduce and just impose on ourselves. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really reminded of Kant in the, um, the categorical imperative. Is the organization of society, is its politics simply a rule book? And again, I think this is maybe something that, that Plato is struggling here with, saying that's the extreme form of the argument. And that humans really have no autonomous input other than deducing what this guidebook is and following the rules of the gods or we just are toys, that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. As to the second point, you know, this is an ideal society. And so in the Republic, right, you only have the philosopher kings. Now here, I think he's making two arguments. I think you did point to one, which is to say that the wealthy person, and it even speaks to the question of the purpose of wealth. Why is someone wealthy? Is it just to be lazy and to indulge every appetite and to live a selfish life that way? Or is it you use that leisure to indeed elevate yourself and take a leadership role and help elevate society? And so, I mean, the idea of being torn apart, I mean, I think really does speak to the question. I think you did point to this to some degree, James, which is are the lower class going to overthrow you? 
And maybe you deserve to be overthrown. Maybe you deserve to be killed by your slaves. If you're just going to lead this very hedonistic life of no purpose, except feeding your appetites, then maybe you should be torn apart. Instead, you should use your position and wealth and leisure to elevate yourself and to help elevate society. Help change the customs in ways that align it with rationality, align it with justice. I mean, I think there is, I mean, I remember, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invoke Curb Your Enthusiasm very quickly. Because there's like one early episode of that series where Larry David is obsessing over whether or not he double tips somebody. Now, this man's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he's thinking, well, did I give him two 20s and he only does this one? And so he starts harassing this who's a, a bus boy. And the guy's like, look, if you want your money back, have it back. I mean, you know, and, and so, you know, I even after watching that episode, I'm like, you know, almost it could be taken as a commentary on how the wealthy are just a waste. Like they have nothing to do with their time. They're just turned inward and they're just consuming resources excessively to no broader purpose. And so, again, Plato was saying the purpose of wealth and leisure is not hedonism. Indeed, it is to serve society. And so, again, the ideal could be read into this. It's just not the philosopher kings. You have a broader participation of society in terms of governance, in terms of, again, helping to transpose the laws, again, into a good customs and good practices. Thank you very much. Thank you. And interesting that you raise the philosopher king, because uh, in the Republic, it's said that, you know, while that might be the ideal, philosopher kings are very rare. And so maybe on the practical side, uh, we have to realize that there aren't going to be philosopher kings. And so the community has to come together. And as you said, the wealthy, as it's the job of the philosopher king to go back into the cave and help the people come out of the cave in the Republic, maybe it's the job of the wealthy, as you said, to not just sit idly by and it's their duty to help others. And, you know, it's interesting because I read this morning, I can't remember whether it was the New York Times, maybe they were talking about the four or five top paid executives in the US. And I think one of the companies, the executive was earning something like 30,000 times the wages of the average worker. So at some point, you know, there's a balance that this something could go out of balance. And, you know, it's interesting, too, in the laws that he's very specific, the Athenian is very specific about wealth, and the wealthiest should not have more than four times the wealth of the, the poorest. So there, there has to be that strict limit. And I think that's maybe a method of balance. And you asked the question about free will, which I thought was really interesting. And I would just, again, highlight this statement. So after he, right after he says, a man is being created as a toy for God, he says, and that this is the point, the great point in his favor. And I read that uh, after some consideration as being, well, a child loves his toys. And so maybe this is, we are loved by, loved <clears throat> by God. The other part in this part from the Odyssey, when it says, and heaven will prompt the rest, which isn't to say that heaven dictates the rest, heaven prompts the rest. And we don't have to follow the prompt. A lot of people don't. So I think that's maybe uh, two signs maybe for free will there. So. If I could just say this about the notion, a couple of things, just if I could just interject. You know, one thing is, and this is the point in his great favor. Ultimately, I think the argument is that, think about it from the God's perspective. I mean, why would God, why would the gods or God, why would they bother to, with our affairs, right? Why would they care how we live, you know, if, if we live in squalor or whatever the case may be? So in other words, the idea that the gods even take favor upon us and seek to give us guidance and put that out there. And again, I think he's putting forward a strong argument in terms of God setting down very clear guidelines, right? This is the extreme argument he's putting forward. Is that our purpose simply to read the will of the gods or God and just follow that to the letter? And there's so again, the idea that the fact that God does try to divine knowledge to us, that's in our favor. I think that's what he's saying. And yeah, I mean, in the end, again, the notion of toys why would they bother to do this? But thankfully they do. Gods are all here and we're really down here. So the fact that they even deign to give us some guidance, we're lucky. Now, how much is the question? The other thing I would say is just very quickly in terms of the wealthy is that, and again, this is what comes to mind. You know, you look at someone like Donald Trump, you look at someone like the Mercers in that they coarsen. Again, the argument would be in this context, they're not really elevating society, they're debasing it. 
And so maybe in Plato's mindset, you're really working against the good society. You're working against justice. Maybe there's an argument to say, well, you know, you need to be replaced, right? Or you should be your wealth taken away. And so that's a, that's a question that we really have to ask ourselves, even in, in Plato's context, which is, you know, what do you do with someone that's wealthy that, again, is working against the public, right? Shouldn't the public have the right to say, you know what, you're abusing that resource and that wealth, so we take it away. Not necessarily rip them apart, but we take that away. Again, you could read some of that in terms of what Plato's saying. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, they do that in Magnesia. One of the duties of the guardians of the laws is to keep a register of everybody's wealth and to ensure that nobody gets over the limits that are specified. So, yeah, no, it's very interesting. And, you know, just to remind everybody about book 10, where we started, you know, you said is our job to follow God's will. Does God have a will? So in book 10, uh, it says that at the very center of the universe, before the physical universe was created, there was reason. There is reason at the very center of the universe. And that's where God is found. So God maybe doesn't have a will. God is maybe reason itself. And we have access to the realm of reason, which is in the realm of being, through our minds. And if God maybe wants us to do anything, it's to exercise that faculty of reason to reach that realm where the gods are. And as the Athenian says, if you want to reach that, you have to think, you have to, you know, think like a god. So, uh, so no, I appreciate that. So I have Michael and Fred, and then I'm going to do the last reading today because it's, I think it's rather important reading. So oh, Michael disappeared. Uh, we'll go to Fred in that case. Fred. The Athenian aristocracy uh, could rest in their laurels until there was a war. And then they were expected to participate in that war. Um, Plato is an excellent example where he spent 10 years as a combatant in the Peloponnesian Wars. I think it's interesting that in 803E, it says that a man should spend his whole life at play, in quote, sacrificing, singing, dancing, so that he can win the favor of the gods and protect himself from his enemies and conquer them in battle has a purpose. And that, that's just simply uncontested here among the, the, the other people who are talking. There are two purposes of play. One is simple enjoyment. And the second is preparation for life. And in those times, and in our times, a whole lot of play is preparation for battle. Um, for example, when I played with my cat Perdita, when she would grab the, the cat toy, I would say, oh, you're such a good predator. And she would swish her tail like, oh yeah, I, I am a good predator, aren't I? I? I grabbed it and killed it. You know, and that there's not too much difference between that and the fundamental purpose of play through history, which is preparation for battle. I mean, after all, that's what chess is about in medieval times. So it's simply understood here uh, that man lives in a hopefully intermittent state of war with his enemies and that play is a way of preparation for battle. I think it's, it's interesting that that's brought out, that, that that's the function of play here. Mm -hmm. And it's very ironic. You wouldn't, would not think that, for example, dancing as a preparation for battle but that's what he draw. That's what he brings out here. Is that dan even dancing is a preparation for war? It shows how fundamental uh, war is to this society. That's all. Thanks. Well, thank you for that historical context. I think it's very helpful, and it makes me think too of, you know, even up until you know the times that the European monarchies started to fall, it was the noble class's role to lead in the military. Now, again, you know, this colony of Magnesia that they're founding is not going to be founded for the purpose of war, but I think it's, you know, clearly important to defend, you know, if they have a very different than unique colony worth defending, that it has to be defended. You know, you talked in an earlier book about sailors coming in from outside, raiding on the shore, and then just doing their damage and disappearing. So one needs to protect against that, I guess. So thank you. I have Darren, and then we are about only 15 minutes left in the scheduled time, but we started late. So I'm hoping that folks can stay for an extra 10 or 15 minutes, maybe, because I do want to get this last reading in. So after Darren, we'll do the last reading. And as I said, I, I think it's rather important. So we'll have a little discussion about that before we wrap up. 
Uh, so Darren, your thoughts. Thanks, James. So I want to give another interpretation of us being toys for God thing. It seems like something you're interested in, and, and it is very interesting, I think. Um, but just first remark regarding what Fred just said. Yeah, so it was definitely something I noticed that a lot of these exercises are described as preparations for war. The thing that stood out for me was how wrestling was at multiple points described because he was saying how like people got wrestling wrong. People think we practice wrestling, you know, for war, but it's really for leisure. But he says it's really the other way around. It's really ultimately it should be towards war, which is why we shouldn't have all these other kinds of wrestling, which he says we should not be practiced like various kinds of like grappling or whatever. I don't know. There are a lot of details. Um, okay. So regarding, yeah, so this interpretation of being a toy for God, first of all, I really liked what you said, James, about it's because, you know, a child loves his toy. So it's a sense of, it's actually, it's not to diminish us. It's to say that, you know, we are a value. So I really like the way you put that. I just want to tie this in with other parts of the text, which I think maybe is also really what you, your interpretation. So he said, we read this earlier that we should strive for a state between the extremes of pleasure and pain. So it's not like either one <laughs> or exclusively or whatever, or not having pain and having all pleasure. It's like we should strive for like a balance in between. So there is pleasure involved. So as Fred already said, he sort of told the words out of my mouth, there's pleasure in playing. So it would make sense that God is not just like, maybe there is a kind of view of God as maybe just reason per se, but here, I think, at least in the in the text in this book seven, right? <laughs> book seven, that there is pleasure involved. That's how God was described as the state of God, state was God described. I also want to make another connection, uh, this idea with um, the drinking parties, because I remember that that was also described as play. So I found this passage, I just searched my notes. So unfortunately, it, it is in the, uh, the uh, Hackett translation, though. So uh, it says that we should summon Dionysus to what is at once the playtime and the prayer time of the old, which the God gave to mankind to help cure the crabbiness of age. This is the gift he gave us to make us young again. We forget our peevishness and our hard cast of mind. We become softer and grow uh, and our cast hard cast of mind and our hard cast of mind, sorry, becomes softer and grows more malleable, just like iron thrust in a fire. Mm. I really like this passage. So it is also described as a kind of play time, but also prayer time. So these are these are related. And of course, we saw you know, the first three books on drinking parties, <laughs> who would have thought um, that drinking parties are not for everyone, though. They're reserved for the old, precisely because of what I just read, because they get sort of, they become hard and stern and get crabby. So it's only the old people who, who should drink a lot. Well, actually, middle-aged people can drink, but in moderation. But old people can drink as much as they want. <laughs> so that they, they get this spirit again. So I think Plato has, just with all this discussion of the state of God and this all this about, you know, drinking parties that began, this, uh, began the laws, like he has this idea, I feel like it's not just reason he's interested in. We, 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 there should be this spirit of lightheartedness and I think like love maybe. Because there's always a contrast of the sophists who have rationality, but their suspicion is that they don't have love. So they just have, it's not love of wisdom. They don't have philosophy because they don't have the love first part, um, mm -hmm. even though they might have reason. And so all this about being plaything, being the toy for God and these drinking parties, I feel like it all just zooms in on this idea that, yes, reason's important, but like the way that the good life looks like is like almost kind of like, it has this lightheartedness to it, which is why all these crabby old men have to drink. <laughs> um, and he also describes yeah. in that passage you read at 803C that a man should spend his whole life at play, sacrificing, singing, dancing for the gods. So yeah. it's interesting that it's described as being at play. Yeah. And this yeah. is, yeah, just one, la just one last really quick thought. And he says that this is what, um, in the section on the drinking parties, that this picture of like this lively individual with the liveliness he says it's what an educated person should look like. So it's not education is not just about like theory and laws or whatever. It's also this education of the soul. So we so we sort of exist in this kind of, I don't know, this happy state where we're not just rational, but also like crabby and crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's great. Thank you for reminding us of that great passage about the uh, crabbiness of old age. And it makes me think of the original Star Trek series, Mr. Spock, you know, was this half logical, half emotional being 
And I think it was really a message about the need to balance the emotion. And you said, I think the magic word, the S word, spirit, because in Plato's view of the soul, the soul is exists in three parts. There's spirit and need, and uh, that those are moderated by reason. So reason's job isn't to point us solely in a direction of pure functionality and getting the job done, but it needs, you need some spirit along the way. And I think that's a very practical suggestion uh, in this community is that you can't have a community without spirit. And some communities try it now. I mean, some communities live under rules where uh, they are not allowed to listen to music. And, you know, it, it, the leaders say, God says, you must not listen to music. Well, you know, uh, does God say that? Or does God say that you can listen to music, but you must balance it with some sort of, you know, practical things as well. So yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot to think about there. But again, it makes me think about the very center of the universe being reason. And the purpose of reason is to strike that balance and not just to find, you know, one way or the other. Um, so let me go on to this last reading here. It's near the end of book seven. This is from 819b to 820e. And this is a bit of geometry, but I think it's really talking about the question of is man who is a measurer the measure of all things. So I wanted to talk about this for a little bit here and just remind people that Plato was a geometer. And there was a section that I just had on the screen from Theotetus, which really talks again about the importance of numbers and being able to calculate, which in the Republic, he said, is absolutely a key skill for a philosopher is numbers and, and geometry. So here he builds on that. At 819b, the Athenian starts so we should insist that gentlemen should study each of these subjects to at least the same level as very many children in Egypt. So he's talked about Egypt and how the education system there is different. So the very many children in Egypt who acquire such knowledge at the same time as they learn to read and write. First, lessons in calculation have been devised for tiny tots to learn while they are enjoying themselves at play. They divide up a given number of garlands or apples among larger and smaller groups and arrange boxers and wrestlers in an alternation of buys and pairs or in a sequence of either and in the various further ways in which the buys and pairs naturally succeed each other. Another game the teachers play with them is to jumble up bowls of gold and bronze and silver and so on, or distribute whole sets of one material. In this way, as I indicated, they make uses of elementary arithmetic, an integral part of their pupils' play, so that they get a useful introduction to the art of marshalling, leading and deploying an army, or running a household. And in general, they make them more alert and resourceful persons. Next, the teacher puts the children on to measuring lengths, surfaces, and solids, a study which rescues them from the deep-rooted ignorance at once comic and shocking that all men display in this field. Clinius says, what sort of ignorance do you mean in particular? The Athenian replies, my dear Clinius, even I took a very long time to discover mankind's plight in this business, but when I did, I was amazed and could scarcely believe that human beings could suffer from such swinish stupidity. I blushed not only for myself, but for Greeks in general. And he says, why so? Go on, sir. Tell us what you're getting at. I'll explain, or rather, I'll make my point by asking you a few questions. Here's a simple one. You know what's meant by a line, I suppose? And he says, of course. The scene continues, very well. What about a surface? Then he says, surely. Then he says, you appreciate that these two are distinct things and that volume is a third? Then he says, naturally. Then he says, and you regard all these as commensurable? And, you know, just to break here, commensurable is when you can put things with respect to each other in whole fractions. So if something is one half of the other or one third of the other, that would be commensurable. So it's the relationship between things here that he's talking about. So the relationship between a line and a surface. So, you know, if you think of a cube, for example, the line is the edge, the surface is the face of the cube, and the volume would be inside the cube. So he's saying, and you regard all of these as commensurable? Clinia says, yes. Athenian says, and one length, I suppose, is essentially expressible in terms of another length, one surface in terms of another surface, and one volume in terms of another volume? Athenian says, exactly. Athenian says, well, what if some of these can't be thus expressed, either exactly or approximately? What if some can and some cannot, in spite of your thinking they all can? What do you think of your ideas on the subject now? Athenian says, they're worthless, obviously. Athenian says, what about the relationship of line and surface to volume? or surface and line to each other. Don't all we Greeks regard them as in some sense commensurable? And he says, we certainly do. The Athenian continues, but if, as I put it, all we Greeks believe them to be commensurable when fundamentally they are incommensurable, 
one had better address these people as follows, blushing all the while on their behalf. Now then, most esteemed among the Greeks, isn't this one of those subjects we said it was disgraceful not to understand? Not that a knowledge of the basic essentials was much to be proud of? Of course, agrees Clinius. Athena says, now there are a number of additional related topics which are a fertile breeding ground for mistakes similar to those we've mentioned. What sort of topics, asks Clinius. The real relationship between commensurables and incommensurables. We must be very poor specimens if on inspection we can't tell them apart. These are the same problems we ought to keep on putting up to each other in a competitive spirit when we've sufficient time to do them justice. And it's a much more civilized pastime for old men than checkers. Clinius agrees, perhaps so. Come to think of it, checkers is not radically different from such studies. Well, Clinius, I maintain that these subjects are what the younger generation should go in for. They do no harm, and they are not very difficult. They can be learned in play, and so far from harming the state, they'll do it some good. But if anyone disagrees, we must listen to his case. Of course, agrees Clinius. Athenius says, however, although obviously we shall sanction them if that proves to be their effect, we shall reject them if they seem to disappoint our expectations. Obviously, indeed, agrees Clinius, no doubt about it. Athenius says, well then, sir, so that our legal code shall have no gaps, let's regard these studies as an established but independent part of the desired curriculum. Independent, that is, of the rest of the framework of the state, so that they can be redeemed like pledges in case the arrangements fail to work out to the satisfaction of us, the depositors, and you, the pledgees. So the end of that is just a part about being able to amend things in the future and having that knowledge necessary to understand the relationships of things so that when things get out of balance, that you have the ability to restore some balance. But I really wanted to ask a question about when he says that all things are fundamentally incommensurable. Incommensurable means that you cannot put in the end all things in a fixed fractional relationship. Something that's incommensurable is a continued fraction. Like the square root of two produces a continued fraction, a fraction that goes on forever. It never stops. Any thinking about why he might say it's fundamentally they're incommensurable? And maybe a, a hint there is what Plato said in Timaeus, as well as in Book 10, that the universe is spherical. When everything is spherical, or eventually everything is spherical, can you ever have commensurability? Right? Because the sphere is measured by pi, or at least the ratio of circumference to diameter is measured by pi, and that's not commensurable. That's incommensurable. Pi is both incommensurable and transcendental, which means that it can't be expressed algebraically. So in a spherical universe, can you have fundamentally everything being commensurable? And if everything is commensurable, that means that man can know all things, doesn't it? Because it's just a question of calculating. You can find those relationships. But here he's saying, no, it's incommensurable. You can never find the relationships. It, this just really struck me in terms of the universe that we now know that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says you cannot know both position and momentum at the same time equally. You don't have equal knowledge of both of those. And then Gödel says that everything that we think we know relies on a previous axiom or, or theory. So we, we never can get to the original theory. So there is this, I think, statement here he's saying that we can't know everything. And so we need to somehow come together to reach some sort of agreement and being able to calculate relationships of things uh, is important when we can't fully determine that they're commensurable. So Darren, your thoughts? I just have more of a question about this. This is sort of a bit of a mysterious part of book seven. And um, yeah, and it's tied into, you know, the discussion education regarding mathematics, astronomy, and all that. I'm wondering if this discussion here about incommensurability so maybe it's something to do with circles but also i was wondering if, if you or others think it might be related to motion somehow in particular like circular motion i don't know if like all motion is circular <laughs> for plato i don't know although you know in other texts like the timaeus things are described as moving in circle that seems to be a, an obsession of plato's and just a bit regarding this so I, i'm wondering motion because like i feel like you know, Plato just sort of sneaks in this these interests and these ideas he has the background in metaphysics like all the time. They're like <laughs> they're like snuck in here here and there, but you can barely notice it. Like for instance, I, I even wondered like 
when he was talking about how we should always keep infants in motion, he even talked about something about the athletics of the um yeah, of the baby, yeah. The embryo, of the embryo yeah, or something yeah, like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how they always have to be kept in motion. I was like, okay, let's recall like that that part of the text. It was not just let's try to keep them in motion as much as possible. I think it was quite literally like they should always be in motion. So they should always be carried around, like there were ships at sea or whatever. And um I, I was even wondering then, I was like, okay, is this Plato being <laughs> being a little bit weird maybe? And, you know, saying like, because everything's in motion and, you know, motion is how things sort of happen for us in our world of becoming that, you know, we have to make sure that babies and uh, embryos are also <laughs> in this situation. I, I don't know. It just, it just made me think of Plato's in the background, you know, even when he's writing about ethics, there's some metaphysics in the background. I don't know. So I thought maybe this discussion was about motions in particular circular motion as well but i don't know yeah yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great observation and certainly we know now that everything in the universe is in motion if if something were to come to a stop like like gravity is pulling everything down right so gravity wants motion to stop but things keep going right because if gravity were allowed to win the whole universe would stop so we know that everything's in motion we know that time is different the uh, further you go away from the earth time is measured differently from when you're on earth. There is this relativity now. I mean, a lot of this came out in Einstein's theories in 1905 and 1915, but we do know that everything is in motion. And yeah, so the question is, and a lot of the measurements, like for example, the measurement that's used for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the uncertainty in position multiplied by the uncertainty in momentum is greater than or equal to the Planck constant distributed over two pi, which is a circle. And the Planck constant is the minimum measurement in the physical universe. We know that minimum me measurement now. And so the fact that the uncertainty in position and momentum is greater than the minimum means that there is always motion. In fact, I just listened to a great podcast. I've listened to it a few times now. The scientist states specifically that every quantum is still in motion. Even, even in the vacuum, there is motion. In fact, she says the calculations show that there is infinite motion in the vacuum yeah, or infinite pressure in the vacuum. It's a very interesting concept that I think it's leading to a lot of modern science. So maybe the, the theory here is that in a limitless universe would have to be circular, right? Because how many limits are there on the surface of a sphere or a circle for that matter? I mean, what's the answer? Infinite, right? Or, or uncountable. We, we don't know. Like people have tried to calculate the decimals of pi or the fractions of pi to trillions of digits now, and they don't find any repeating patterns except for, I think there's three sixes in around a 900th decimal, but that's about the only pattern that they could find. So yeah, I mean, this the, the importance of the circle as being something that is both without limit in terms of the number of points that could be on the surface. And the other thing about the circle is that it has no beginning and no end, right? Like, can you point to a beginning and end on any circle? No, you, you don't know where it begins and you don't know where it ends. And so that's maybe kind of a great design for a universe with no beginning and no end, or at least no discernible beginning and end, especially when we're faced with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Gödel's incompleteness theorems. So I don't know. I, I find there's a lot of fundamental logic here. And when he says everything's fundamentally incommensurable, I mean, this diagram I have here on the screen of the circle with the radian coming out from the middle, touching the four pi over three measurement on the bottom left there, and they, they draw a square around it or a rectangle. That rectangle would not be commensurable because it's touching the edge of the circle. And it's it's interesting how Plato puts these things in his dialogues. It, you know, And as you said, it, it kind of comes here at the end of this section, kind of just a little bit out of nowhere, hitting you over the head with it. <laughs> and then he goes on. And, but, you know, I, I think it really does, he's trying to tell us something with respect to motion. So thanks. Yeah, I, I think some really good questions there. Any other thoughts on this particular section? It is important. I, I think people forget that Plato was a geometer. And there is, I think, something that he is telling us here and in Timaeus. And as I've mentioned a number of times before, Timaeus is where he introduced the only five solids in the universe, only five regular solids in the universe that we now call platonic solids because of him. And the unique feature of these five solids, as I've said before, is that all of their vertices touch or inscribe the surface of a sphere. 
all of those five, and they're only those five, and all of those five fit together. So there's something interesting about the geometry of those five platonic solids and spheres, and maybe the design of the universe and what he's talking about here in terms of incommensurability. So I don't know. I don't hear people discussing this in great depth when they talk about Plato. And I think that's maybe because the study of geometry and math has long since been largely divorced from the study of philosophy, uh, which may be unfortunate. So Taryn. So just have a question. I'm just trying to understand this. So the incommensurability is like not a bad thing, right? It's just part of the order of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. It's, okay. Because I, I, it, it sort of sounds mysterious as if it's like there's something that we can't understand or that's yeah. missing. Yeah. But it, it, in this section, is he just trying to maybe flag that there is a kind of order of the universe? Because I, mm -hmm. I do recall in yeah. this section, he was against the so-called theological errors where people thought like the planets yeah. just go wherever they want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and actually, Kepler's laws now say that the planets actually follow defined paths it, it, with respect to each other. So, yeah, so it's a really good question, actually. Is it a bad thing? It's a bad thing to the extent of people who think that they can know everything, to the extent that people think that everything is computable, as a lot of perhaps, you know, investors are now thinking that they can compute intelligence, right? Like a lot of companies are looking for artificial general intelligence, which is the code to intelligence. So they think that that's something that can be computed. Incommensurability says, no, it cannot be computed. Um, so that that is a bad thing for people who would prefer certainty. But then we have to admit that we live in Heisenberg and Gödel's universe, where uncertainty is a fundamental element of the universe. And we just simply have to deal with it. We, we simply cannot be certain about the theories on which we are building things because there's always a preceding theory. That's what Gödel said. And we cannot be certain about, at the same time, we cannot be certain about the position and momentum of a physical object. So we have to live with uncertainty. So uncertainty is discomforting to people. So I guess they would see that as bad. But I think I would see it as great that the universe is incommensurable because it means that it has no end. I mean, if we could calculate everything, if we could calculate the code to intelligence, what would that leave us, right? It would leave us nothing. So yeah, I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And I think maybe he's trying to say that here and he's trying to, he's trying to warn us that there is this fundamental uncertainty. There's this fundamental incommensurability, that uncertainty. And we now know that that's physically true. And so when you have uncertainty, you need to get together to work things out and figure out the next steps. No one is individually capable of doing it and no computer is capable of doing it. So Darren and then George. Yeah, just a um, little thought. I wonder if it matters too that the planets that have these motions, circular motions, are at least in the Timaeus and I think in in... In other places too, that Plato does identify them as gods themselves. So maybe, yeah, maybe it matters that this incommensurability isn't just about you know what we would sort of just understand as a ball of rock per se, but it's about like it's about you know the highest things. It's about what we think we can know about the gods. Like we can know a lot, but maybe we shouldn't be so arrogant as to think we you know we know them, and and at least we should not fall into the theological errors of saying a lot of things about them that they're not, that yeah. Plato seems to, or the Athenian, but, you know, Plato yeah. basically is really against. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well said. I mean, it's, it's that need for humility, um, understanding that we are part of the universe, but the universe doesn't exist for us. We exist for the universe. And yeah, you remind me that he does say that the universal soul exists everywhere, even in the sun he's talking about. Yeah, really interesting ideas. Yeah, no, so, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and, and just quickly in the Timaeus, he says we should imitate the motions. Like the ideal ethical being, I guess, is when the motions within our soul is in harmonized with the motions mm -hmm. of the heavens and the gods and the connection. And one of the connections is music. So that mm -hmm. highlights the importance of music for him again. Yeah. Yeah, and music, I think, was very important to the Pythagoreans that uh, Plato was involved with. And, uh, you know, certainly, I think it was Kepler who was working with the idea of the music of the spheres in terms of the planetary bodies having some sort of uh, rhythm. Um, and I think physics are finding, this, I've written articles on how there's actually been recently found a low vibrational hum to the entire universe. They measured the consistent vibrational hum through the entire universe. So there's maybe some basis for this. 
But yeah, it makes me think too about the soul, you know, as maybe something that is inherently incommensurable, because if the soul were commensurable, then again, you know, we would be able to know the beginning and the end of our own souls, which I think would um, not be a very happy situation. I don't think, uh, I'd rather think that my soul is rather limitless. I'd rather not think that it has a limit, so... Yeah, um, it yeah. it's saying the soul is something different than yeah. all the other things that can be yeah. measured. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and in in the in the philibus, you know, he does talk about the difference between the material and the immaterial, and the immaterial would not be commensurable to anything. So you know, the universe is a mixture of that material and immaterial, right? The immaterial is in our heads, the material is in our bodies, and you know, we live in both realms: the the immaterial realm of being and the material realm of becoming. So, so thanks, uh, George. Your thoughts. You know, I know we're winding down, but I wanted to just very briefly go back for a moment, if I could, to the notion of the wealthy that are insolent, that are squandering their resources and just leading a life of hedonism. There's almost like an anger there when you think about that. Talked about having them ripped apart. And, you know, what I think is partly um, motivating Plato here is the idea that that kind of behavior actually undermines the legitimacy of society, which is to say, who wants to fight for a society where the wealthy are indolent? They're just such a drain on our resources. Is this what I'm fighting for? Is this what I'm killing for? Is this what I'm going to die for to prop up these fat, slothful individuals? And so, again, we, and my point is that we read an art and anger in Plato. It's more than simply a political commentary. It's a notion that Maybe even Athens was defeated, maybe because the idea that the wealthy were not carrying their weight and people just didn't want to fight yeah. for Athens. Yeah. Just yeah. that thought. Yeah, that, that's a great observation. And, you know, it's, it's again that need for humility, you know, that these wealthy people think that they know that the way things should turn out, I guess. But, uh, you know, maybe what he's saying here is that, no, don't ever stop working and playing because you have a lot to learn still. And I think that's maybe part of that last reading that I did that none of us knows for certain and we all have to contribute to things so as you said a lot of the poor people are not going to be motivated to help the wealthy if there's that much of an imbalance in things if i could just quickly comment just yeah. quickly comment there is an argument that the fall of the western empire i'm talking about rome forgive me the fall of the western roman empire resulted from the extreme concentration of wealth yeah. that occurred in the empire where a very small number of people own massive amounts of property. And then in the end, that's why the Western Empire fell, because yeah. people just don't want to fight for it anymore. Just right. a thought. <laughs> yeah. That is, I think, a common observation about the fall of Rome. It got too successful for its own good. It lost its own balance. So um, We are out of time. I, I will, I, if it's just a minute or two, I would entertain your comment. Thank you. Um, can you point me to the text talking about... Uh... The wealthy. It's this part here, I think, that uh, we were just referring to. Um, it's 806E to 807D, the fate of the idol. And it's this part of man who lives like that won't be able to escape the fate he deserves. And the fate of an idle, fatted beast that takes life easy is usually to be torn to pieces by some other animal. It was that. And then there was a preceding section as well that talks again about the need to continue playing and learning, which is 803A to 804C. So that, sorry, that, the, the, yeah, sorry yeah. the idol was the wealthy? Uh, the idol fatted beast, yes. The fatted beast referring to the wealth that they, they just feed themselves with their wealth and they let other people get poor. And uh, Is that the, your interpretation or is it uh, written in, in here? It's right here on the screen. So a man who lives like that won't be able to escape the fate he deserves and the fate of an idol fatted beast that takes life easy is usually to be torn to pieces by some other animal, one of the skinny kind who have been emaciated by a life of daring and endurance. So these people who are oppressed or uh, have no hope in life, they get desperate. And at some point when the balance swings too far out of their favor, because there's so many of them, and you know we, we see these cases, you know, as George said, with the Roman Empire, but we see modern cases as well where things get out of balance and you know, I think this is a lesson to, that there is some balance that needs to be struck. It's not just one person for themselves. It's it's all we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Yeah, I agree. We yeah. we need to take individual yeah. responsibility as well as yeah. collective yeah. responsibility. But yeah. in my according to my understanding, 
the wealthy are usually much more hardworking. They cannot be idle and be wealthy, especially the first generation, uh, the the self-made people. Mm -hmm. They're extremely hardworking, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, a lot of poor people are idle and they're fat. If you look oh, at the yeah. demographics, it's yeah. the wealthy who are skinny, and it's the, well, yeah. the fat. I, I, sorry, yeah. the the poor yeah. people who are yeah. fat and yeah. uh, idle and lazy. Yeah. I think this will get off track here and I do need to end the meeting, but I would just say that, you know, in terms of physical fatness, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on nowadays with the quality of food and levels of obesity. And a lot of people are obese, wealthy and poor. I think really what is being said here is that those who let themselves get idle, who tend to be the wealthiest because they can live in palaces and they can have people serving them they tend to be the idol. And so... Yeah, That's think, your interpretation. It's, it's not my understanding from reading this. But we can we can so, agree to disagree on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, sure. But, but yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for... I mean, there are situations where it's obviously different, but yeah. Um, Darren, unfortunately, I'm going to run out of time here. So I think we'll just end the meeting at this point. But I do want to thank everybody for attending. And it's it we did get through book seven, which is a really big book, actually. And I think we touched on a lot of key points. So this has been great. I want to say that for the next meeting, we're going to skip book eight. So we'll go directly to book nine, but we'll bring in some of the there's a few important points in book eight that we'll try to bring into that discussion. Book eight is shorter in any event. Book nine is kind of rich in content. So I think we'll focus on that for the next meeting in two weeks, continue to build on the themes that we've been talking about throughout this in terms of community and building a estate based on virtue and collaboration. So again, thank you for everybody for being here. And those who want to stay online for a casual, you know, relatively short discussion since we've gone over time, I'm happy to do so. And then otherwise, I will end the recording and invite everybody back in two weeks. So thank you very much. <laughs>